Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're right at 10 o'clock, so I am going to go ahead and get started with today's training. We're going to be talking about this year's invasive species scavenger hunt. So thank you all for being here and for your interest in participating in this event. Uh, my name is Amy Jewett, and I am the Pennsylvania IMAP Invasives Program Coordinator with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And uh, I want to first talk about, um, to get things started, um, this will be the fourth year that we are hosting the scavenger hunt. So some of the folks that are on the webinar today, you may have participated in this event before and may already be familiar with it, and some of you uh, may be new. So welcome to everyone. Uh, so this uh, particular event has uh, multiple purposes for why we like to host it. Um, so I just wanted to talk about that first um, to kind of um, lay a, a foundation for, for what this event is all about. Um, so first and foremost is uh, this event is a way to encourage participants to um, search for invasive species occurrences that are found in natural areas throughout Pennsylvania. Um, and not only to search for species, but to help to hone your survey efforts um, on 10 specific species. Um, I think as many of us know, there are many, many invasive species uh, across Pennsylvania, and I know it can feel um, somewhat overwhelming sometimes when we think about going out and searching for and reporting um, everything that we're finding. And so this event is going to help to kind of hone in your search efforts by looking for just 10 specific species. And that's going to include both common and uh, emerging invasive species. Uh, I will note that if you find other invasive species in your um, search, uh, during your search efforts, you can include them into the IMAP Invasives platform. Um, but just, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the training, but just don't tag those occurrences to the survey, or I'm sorry, the scavenger hunt project. Um, so only the species that are on the checklist are the ones that you'll be tagging to a project. But as I mentioned, we'll talk about that um, here in a little bit. Um, also, the scavenger hunt is a really great way to increase the amount of data that we have available in IMAP invasives um, for use by natural resource professionals, land managers, and others across our state. Um, and it's important to note that all the data that we do gather from this particular event uh, is expert vetted um, after being submitted to the database. And so that is part of our program. We want to make sure that all the data we are displaying in IMAP invasives um, can be trusted and can be used by uh, natural resource professionals and others um, for management um, uh, purposes. And finally, this event is a way to help our participants in just recognizing how prolific some of our uh, invasive species are throughout the Commonwealth, and also to encourage you to be on the lookout for some newly emerging species, so ones that you may not already be familiar with or not have on your radar. This is a way to help to um, kind of help you to recognize some new species that you may not already be familiar with. Um, I will mention, I forgot to say this at the very beginning, but if folks do have questions as we go through the training today, please feel free to utilize the Q&A feature that is uh, included in the webinar. Um, I will be helping to, I'll be uh, answering questions uh, once we get to the very end, but feel free to type in your questions um, throughout the training or at the very end um, as you have them. So to give an overview of what you'll need to know in order to participate in this year's scavenger hunt. Um, so we kind of break it down by who, what, when, where, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the who is you, each of you, um, and your technology of choice in order to report your findings of invasive species. So that might be a smartphone or a tablet or your desktop or laptop computer. The advantage of using a smartphone or a tablet is that you can utilize our uh, IMAP Invasives mobile apps. Again, that'll be something I'll talk about in, in just a little bit. Um, and you can use those apps while you are um, searching for these species 
uh, in the field. So you don't need to um, take notes and then go back to your home office um, and document it that way. So the apps are a really handy way of being in the field and being able to record information right then and there. Uh, so the what um, you're going to be searching for and reporting uh, either presence or absence data for each of the 10 species that have been selected for this year's 2023 invasive species scavenger hunt checklist. Again, you can search for and report other invasive species that are not on that checklist, but just be sure that you are not um, tagging them under the 2023 invasive species scavenger hunt project in IMAP. Um, so just to clarify what I'm meaning about the presence and absence information. So presence is referring to you look for the species and you found it. And absence or an IMAP, we call it not detected data, uh, is if you look for a species and you did not find it. So um, for purposes of this event, we would like you to record either presence or absence for each of the 10 species. So whether you found it or you didn't, you're still going to be able to record data in IMAP either way. Uh, so the time frame, the when for this event, um, the surveys and the data collection into IMAP invasives is going to be uh, beginning tomorrow, August 1st, and it will go for the whole month of August and it will go till um, August 31st. So where are you going to be searching? Um, so I would encourage folks to be looking for the species on our checklist in uh, your local natural areas um, that are publicly accessible. So this would be uh, parks, forests, um, and game lands and other similar type of, uh, of areas. Um, please do not report cultivated uh, occurrences of these species, such as plantings in yards or gardens or other public spaces. We are not interested in recording cultivated or purposely planted um, occurrences of these species. We just want to know where they're invading these natural areas that we really care about and we want to protect um, from the threat of these uh, specific invasive species. Uh, also to note, if you are surveying or choose to survey on private property, uh, please make sure that you're first obtaining uh, permission from the landowner in order to both conduct your survey and record data in IMAP invasives, which is a publicly access accessible database. Um, so please just keep that in mind. And also um, some additional information to keep in mind. Um, I would encourage you to thoroughly research each of the species on this year's checklist. And as we keep going through the training, um, there is a section um, where I provide that information for you. So I just would ask that you take a, a very good um, close look at that information and just make sure you're very you're, you're becoming very familiar with these species. Get to know their distinguishing characteristics um, so you can tell them apart from a potential um, lookalike species. Um, so again, that information is gonna be provided in the homework section of um, today's presentation. So here is the species list for this year's scavenger hunt event. Um, there is 10 species total, um, and I'll just go through this quickly. So there's European alder, Japanese spurge, oriental bittersweet, Japanese barberry, Mile a Minute Vine, Princess Tree, Purple Loose Strife, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, Beech Leaf Disease Nematode, and Chinese and Japanese Mystery Snails. Um, and each of those are categorized by what type of species they are, just to give you a sense of that in case you're not already familiar with them. So um, just to go through a little bit more on uh, using IMAP invasives, again, if you're new to the platform and you've not already registered for a free user account, you will need to do that in order to participate uh, in this event. And so I'm just gonna briefly uh, talk about how to obtain a free account. So if you go to uh, this URL, paimapinvasives.org, uh, and click on either the login or register buttons. And so you're looking for a screen that looks like this and the buttons are here at the top. Um, you will go to a page where there is then a sign up form and that will look like this. So you can sign up here, fill in this information 
and that will send you um, a confirmation email for a account that you just created um, so that you can then participate in this event. If you already have a uh, IMAP Invasives login account, you just need to fill in your email address and your password up here, and that will give you access to the database. If you have an account, but you have forgotten your password, maybe it's been a little while that you logged into the platform, there is a forgot password area that you can click on that, and that will help you to go through and reset your password if you need to do that. I will mention, um, again, some things I'm forgetting to mention at the beginning, so apologies, um, but I will be sending out a copy of today's presentation, which is in the form of a story map. And anytime you see these blue um, underlined areas, that is a active hyperlink. So you can click right on that and I will show you what I mean. So you can click right on that and it will take you right to our website. Um, and so you should be able to um, uh, click on any of them or are the buttons that you see here in um, uh, in the story map as well. So again, everyone will be given access to that and you can utilize this uh, as a way to kind of navigate to the places that I'm talking about as I mentioned them here in the training. Okay, so that's how you will um, request an account. And then as far as actually reporting your findings, so again, you are gonna be looking for those 10 species and reporting whether you found them or not, so presence or not detected information in IMAP invasives. Keep in mind that photographs of the species that you observe are required for each presence record that you submit to IMAP invasives. And that is necessary in order for your data to be expert vetted. Uh, again, it, in order to um, make sure that our experts can actually vet that information, they will need uh, photographs of the species you are looking at. Uh, photographs are not necessary for not detected or that absence information, although you can feel free to take a photo of the landscape or the area where you are surveying as part of a not detected record if you would like to. Uh, but again, photos are not necessary for not detected information. So there is a few ways that you can report data directly to IMAP invasives. As I mentioned, we do have uh, a few mobile apps. Uh, what's called One is called the classic IMAP invasives mobile app. And also we have a survey one, two, three mobile app that you can utilize um, that can uh, have data entered directly into IMAP invasives. Uh, we also have the um, IMAP invasives uh, online platform itself. Um, that you can use to submit data as well. So there is links here, you can click on these and it will take you to a video tutorial that will show you how to use those apps as well as the online platform. And those videos, I will just skip down here really quickly, are also in integrated directly into the presentation. So you can actually watch those videos directly from here if you would like to. So again, just as a quick reminder, you do want to make sure that you are first requesting a login account prior to submitting any data to IMAP invasives. That's going to be required in order to participate in this event. Also, we get this question a lot, so I just want to mention here for folks so that you know, uh, once you have either of the mobile apps downloaded onto your device, they do not require Wi-Fi or cell reception in order to use them. So you want to make sure that you're, you know, you have it already downloaded onto your device, but once you're in the field, you're not going to need Wi-Fi in order to use it. So um, we get that question a lot. You can be in the most remote area possible and you still will be able to use these apps uh, with no problem. Um, but I will mention in order to actually upload the data that you collect with the apps to the IMAP Invasives platform you will need a Wi-Fi connection in order to do that. Um, that information is part of the video tutorial. So if you have any more questions about that, the video should show you more about what to do. But if you are confused about anything there, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. So I just wanna quickly talk a little bit about some of the differences between the online database and the two mobile apps that we offer and the functionality that is available in each of them. So you can kind of get a good sense of 
uh, which platform might make the most sense for you or which device um, might make the most sense for you to use um, when you are recording data as part of the scavenger hunt this year. So all three of the um, data entry options, the online database, the classic mobile app and survey one, two, three, can uh, be used to record both presence and not detected information. So again, you can use any three of them to do those two things. Um, not that we're doing it for this particular event, but just for your reference, um, the online database and survey one, two, three can also record treatment or management efforts. Um, the classic mobile app cannot. All three can record point data, but only the online database and Survey123 can record lines and polygons. And just to give you a sense for maybe why you might want to consider creating lines or polygons um, is if you might come upon, you know, a large population of purple loosestrife, for example, maybe you're in a wetland area and there's a lot um, of plants and it's a fairly large population. You might want to record a polygon to show that large infestation in that area, whereas a point would not uh, accurately capture that information. You can still choose to create a point, that is fine, but if you wanna go kind of to the next step and really say, well, I know this is a large area that's being infested by this species, um, drawing a polygon will help you to uh, accurately show that in the database. Um, you might draw a line if you are hiking along a trail um, and you see a population of a species right along the trail side. So you could make a line in that case. So keep in mind, you will not be able to create lines or polygons with the classic mobile app, but you will be able to do so with Survey123 or the online database. Um, so as far as, again, just mentioning what I just said before, um, both of the apps are functional without connectivity. So you don't need an internet connection in order to use them, but you do need an internet connection in order to actually use the online database. And then as far as doing some other things, um, additional functionality, functionality like viewing species distributions, creating reports, doing data exports and creating email alerts, those options are only available in the online database. So if you'd like to explore those, um, and do some of those things, just keep in mind that the apps cannot do that. They are used for data collection only. So I just wanted to make that clear to everybody. So again, here's those videos that talk about how to use the mobile app, uh, the classic mobile app, Survey123, and the online database. Okay, so I want to talk about photography and um, taking the pictures of the species that you're observing and why that is so important to make sure that you're taking really good pictures. Uh, again, keeping in mind that the data that gets submitted to IMAP Invasives is going to be expert vetted. So those photographs are going to be super important because that's what's going to be um, the tool that our, our experts are going to be looking at in order to confirm the records that you submit. So you want to make sure that you're taking really good photos. And I want to talk a little bit more about what I mean by a good photo. So first, make sure that you're taking images that are up close to the species that you are observing. Close as in you can, you can touch that plant. Um, avoid taking photos that for are from a distance, okay? So those are not gonna be as helpful. Make sure that your photos are clear and crisp. I know a lot of times we can be in a hurry, we take a picture and then we come back to it and we see it's blurry or fuzzy and it doesn't really show the distinguishing characteristics of that species. And so make sure that as you're taking uh, photos of the species that you're finding, you're slowing down, you're making sure that your camera is focusing on that species and that photo is coming out really clear. Uh, make sure, again, as you're slowing down and, and taking a really good look at what your camera is seeing, make sure that your camera is focused on the species that you are observing, that target species, and not something in the background, because that can happen sometimes. Um, your camera doesn't always know what to focus on, um, and so you want to make sure that you take some time to slow down and make sure that it's capturing the species that you want it to. I mentioned just a minute ago uh, about a species distinguishing characteristics. I bolded this in the presentation because it is super important 
that the photos you take are capturing a species characteristics that distinguish it from something else. So what I mean by that is every species has something particular to it that a expert will look at in order to distinguish it from potentially a lookalike species. And so that's why the homework section of today's presentation is so important because it will give you the information that we'll talk about what each of these species distinguishing characteristics are. So when you're taking photos of a species, for example, you want to hone in on those distinguishing characteristics. You know, maybe think about it this way. Try to avoid taking a photo of just the plant and say, okay, I know that the leaf shape or the flower color or the flower, you know, like the, the way it blooms, whatever it is, um, that's a distinguishing characteristic of this species. And so I'm going to hone my picture in on those things. So that way an expert can see exactly what they need to see and be able to confirm my record. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Make sure that you're keeping in mind that you're taking photos that are defining and showing those distinguishing characteristics of a species. And lastly, this is not required, but it is something to keep in mind because um, it can be helpful when our experts are taking a look at these images that when possible, try to include an item in your image that would show scales or the size of that plant or animal. Um, so if you want to put your hand in the image or a coin or a ruler, those are all ways that will help our um, experts have kind of a, another clue or just something else to look at in order to be able to confirm the records that are coming in. So here's just a few examples um, of the, the tips that I was just providing. Um, so this image here on the left is showing giant knotweed. Um, this picture was taken up close so you can really see um, that, that species well. It's clear and crisp and it includes um, the person's hand in that image. And that's really helpful because um, not that knotweed is on our list this year, but it's going to help to show the size of that leaf. And one of the distinguishing characteristics of giant knotweed is the size of the leaf. Um, and so that's going to be a helpful thing to include here. The middle image uh, is taken from a distance. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what we're looking at here. We could be looking at the purple flowers, which might be purple loosestrife. We could be looking at the other vegetation, like the tall vegetation could be some type of cattail. But from this distance, it's really impossible to know what we were even looking at and, and the, the distinguishing characteristics of that species. So as far as experts uh, using an image like this, it would not be helpful at all. So make sure that you're avoiding taking photos from a distance and instead you're getting up close and really honing in on those distinguishing characteristics of the species. And then finally, the image on the right is uh, showing where the camera was a little confused and it's focusing on the background vegetation rather than the target species that's there in the foreground, which is mile a minute. Um, so again, just keeping in mind um, the importance of slowing down as you're taking these pictures and keeping in mind that the images you submit to IMAP are really uh, important because that's what our experts are going to utilize in order to confirm your data. So you might be wondering, what is the purpose of collecting absence data? Or again, as we refer to it in IMAP, it is called not detected data. So for this particular event, um, it's really helpful for our program to have folks submit both presence and absence because it gives us a visual um, look at where surveys are occurring across the state. So for example, if a participant looks for all 10 of the species in a particular natural area that they are in and they don't find any of them, um, we can still see where that person surveyed because they're going to be recording not detected information in IMAP for all 10 species. Um, but the absence information can provide us with a lot of other useful data as well in IMAP. Um, so for example, it might show that an area is not currently impacted by a particular species and therefore no treatment is necessary at that time. Um, it might suggest that an infestation, if it's found at a later date, um, how long a species may have been there. Um, and it could help to determine whether eradication or, um, or management might be the best course of action. Uh, it can also help to answer questions about the range of a species, the rate of its spread, um, where its habitat requirements might be, 
um, and the invasiveness. Uh, it also can help to distinguish between the lack of data uh, or search effort and the actual absence of a species in an area. So all of these things we can kind of glean from, um, from any not detected data that we have submitted to the database. So I mentioned earlier on about the project. So this is where we're gonna delve into that section. So as you are surveying for the species on this year's checklist, you do wanna make sure that you join the Invasive Species Scavenger Hunt 2023 project in IMAP Invasives and tag both your presence or absence data to that project for the species on the checklist. Um, again, if you're surveying for species that are not on the checklist, please do not tag them to this project because that's not applicable. Um, but for any of the species on the checklist, make sure that you are tagging it to that project. So if you have not joined a project before in IMAP Invasives and are not sure how to do it, this is going to be just a brief intro on what to do. So if you log into IMAP Invasives um, and you click on the main menu that's on the dashboard, it's located in the upper left corner of the map, you'll see an option that says projects. And on the projects page, if you type in the, the project name, Invasive Species Scavenger Hunt 2023 into the search box, you'll see that that project will then appear. And then on that project page, they'll, you'll see text in the upper right corner that says to uh, request to join that project. And so here is a screenshot that's showing you the Invasive Species Scavenger Hunt 2023 project page in IMAP Invasives and that request to join project hyperlink that you can click on. Uh, once you submit your request to be part of that project, that information will come to me and I will do my best to get that approved as quickly as possible. You will then receive an email notification uh, letting you know that your request has been approved and you can go ahead and start tagging your data to that project. Uh, I will mention if you are an existing IMAP Invasives user and have already registered for this event, so you're on today's uh, webinar, you uh, may have already been added as a member of the project um, by myself. So just double check your project membership status by accessing your account, which you can do again from that main menu in IMAP Invasives and looking at the project section of your account profile. So again, if there's any questions on how to join that project or check if you already are a member of the project, um, just refer back to this presentation or please reach out to me for additional um, information. Okay, so another question that we get that I just wanna make sure we have time to talk about today. Um, so as you are reporting information to IMAP Invasives, you can go into the online database and actually view your records or the records of other scavenger hunt participants at any time throughout the month of August or afterwards because uh, they will be tagged to that particular project so they'll be uh, really easy to find. So what you can do, there is a tool in IMAP Invasives called Filter Records. And this screenshot here shows you where that tool is um, on the main screen. It's the third button here at the top. So if you log into the database on the main map page, you can locate that button. Uh, and then on the general tab of the filter records tool, which right here, we're on the general tab there. Um, if you look in the project section, if you select this, uh, the project for this event, Invasive Species Scavenger Hunt 2023, and say apply filter, uh, you will be able to view the data for this project. Um, the one thing you do want to keep in mind in order to actually view the data, because this can kind of trip people up sometimes, you want to make sure that in the layers on off section, you are turning on all applicable data layers that would be um, referencing this project. So that would include confirmed, unconfirmed, approximate, and not detected data layers. So again, if you want to look at this data as it's coming in, as you're submitting it, or you want to look at the data from others, 
make sure that you are turning on the applicable um, mapping layers. If you don't, nothing will appear on the screen and you'll be confused. Um, so again, any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can zoom on the map to get a closer look at the provided data. Uh, you can't see it well here in this particular screenshot, but it will give you uh, a view of the whole country. So if you just zoom in to Pennsylvania, you'll be able to take a closer look at that information. Okay, so moving right along. Um, so as I mentioned previously, uh, this year's scavenger hunt event will begin uh, tomorrow, August 1st, and end on August 31st. And so again, during that time frame, uh, please go ahead and visit the, any natural areas anywhere in Pennsylvania. So it could just be somewhere local to where you live, or if you're traveling, uh, you can uh, take this opportunity to maybe visit some other places that you haven't been to before. Um, and search for the 10 species that are listed on this year's uh, scavenger hunt checklist. And make sure you're reporting either presence or absence for all of the 10 species. At the end of September, five participants will be randomly chosen as the winners of this year's event. And in order to qualify as a prize winner, you need to enter at least one presence or absence record into IMAP for each of the species that are on this year's checklist based on your survey findings. Um, so each of the five winners will receive uh, a prize package of outdoor related gear and a hard copy invasive species field guide. So again, I can't say this enough because I know sometimes people forget from previous events, but please make sure you are tagging your presence or absence data to that invasive species scavenger hunt um, project in IMAP. If it's not tagged to that project, you automatically will not qualify as a prize winner. So make sure that you are doing that. Also, just to clarify, you do not need to submit any presence data to qualify as a prize winner. So if you're looking for these species and not finding them, which is lovely, that, that's a good thing, um, you still can qualify because you took the time uh, and the effort to look for them and you did the, the homework, you, you know, got familiar with what these species are, what they look like. Um, and, and really for my purposes, that's one of the main goals of this event is to help educate each of you about these species so that you are more familiar with them moving forward. So here's the homework section that I keep talking about. This is the largest section of the presentation. So I'm not going to go through it in detail. As I mentioned, I'm gonna be sending out a link to this um, a little bit later today so that folks can start looking at this and, and get yourself prepared for beginning your surveys. Um, but the homework section is going to outline each of the 10 species that are on this year's checklist so you can learn more about them, their distinguishing characteristics, uh, the habitats that they prefer to reside in, and also um, some potential native and exotic lookalike species so that you can differentiate the species on the checklist from any that they may look similar to. So I'm just gonna scroll through this somewhat quickly. I'll spend a little bit of time on the first one just so you guys can see kind of what it looks like and then all the other species will follow that same um, kind of template of how this is put together. So the first species is European alder. So it begins with a uh, image gallery of what this species looks like. Um, and then there's some caption information here at the bottom um, that will show you uh, more information left to right uh, about what's in these images. There is a video here on the side. You can uh, view that directly here in the story map. The scientific name is provided. And uh, one of the first pieces of information that we list is why the species is a problem. Why is it invasive? Why do we even care about tracking it? Here is where that information is provided, um, uh, you know, front and center. So you can get a better sense of, uh, you know, why these species are considered to be invasive. So then we have information on how to identify these species and also additional information about the harm that they cause. 
Again, anything that you see that is blue and underlined is an active hyperlink. So you can click right on that and it will take you to that resource. So I'll click on this particular link and that will take us to a fact sheet that's been created for this species by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Okay, so this is why we're calling it homework because there's a bit of research and reading to do uh, on your end to get more familiar with these species if you're not already familiar with them. Um, you don't have to look at all of the resources provided, but I did wanna put several in here just to give you a sense um, of what that species is all about. Um, and here uh, lists where the source of that information is coming from. There's also in some instances, multiple videos that you can check out. In this case, there's only one. Um, and also uh, information about potential lookalike species. So ones to be aware of that you may confuse European alder with, you know, a, for example, gray alder or smooth alder. So it's important to recognize that in the field while you're searching, you may stumble upon a lookalike. So it's important to keep those um, uh, species in mind to differentiate it from. There's also, also information about the preferred habitat for that species. Where uh, are you gonna be looking to probably find this species? Um, for example, some, some species might prefer to have wet feet. You're only gonna find them in uh, wetland areas or in water. Um, so you're not going to look for them in upland terrestrial sites, for example, um, and vice versa. So that, that preferred habitat information can help to direct you for where you will um, go to survey for this species. And then there's a notes section that gives you additional information about that species, just important things to keep in mind. And then also at the end um, gives you kind of more of a sense of how common a species is, if it's one of um, our more established species, or if it's less commonly found as more of an emerging invasive species. So that map is provided here and the data is being sourced directly from IMAP invasives. So again, just showing the importance of uh, the more data we can compile in IMAP invasives, the better we can understand the distribution of some of these species. So in the story map, you can actually expand that map. Um, you can zoom around, you can pan. Um, so you can just get a closer look at that information if you would uh, like to do that. So that species profile um, for European alder is going to look very similar to all of the other species profiles that are listed here in the homework section. Um, so I'm just gonna scroll through here um, and you guys can see some of the information, but again, I'll be sending out a link to this presentation and you'll be able to take a closer look at everything uh, later on today and, and, and afterwards. So the next species is Japanese spurge. So here's some images of that species and the information that is provided for it. And here's its map, distribution map. And we have Oriental Bittersweet. This is one um, to keep in mind that there is a common lookalike species, um, American Bittersweet, to so make sure you're reading up on that and how to tell the difference between the two. And here is the distribution map for that species from IMAP invasives. Then we have Japanese barberry. And uh, the lookalike for that is uh, European barberry, which is actually another invasive species. And this species, unfortunately, is very prevalent in Pennsylvania, as we can see here in the distribution map for that. Okay, then we have mile a minute vine. Here's the information for that one. There is some other lookalike species to be aware of. So those are pictured here. I will mention too, you can click on some of these images to expand them. So if you wanna take a closer look at it, you can click on it right there in the story map. And the distribution map for mile a minute. Then we have princess tree. and the information for that. Uh, the lookalike for princess tree is Northern Catalpa. So again, you can click on that and that will bring up some of those images so you can see them a little bit better. 
This is one that is more of an emerging species, as you can see from the distribution map. It is not super prevalent in um, all of the state yet. Um, but again, as we survey for this species, we may be finding it in places that we're not aware of that it's already at. Purple loosestrife. This is one that you likely will find in more wet areas generally. And some of its lookalikes. And the distribution map for that species, again, all very common, unfortunately. Then we have hemlock woolly adelgid. Some information on the lookalikes for that species is in a, a fact sheet provided by the Michigan Department of Quality. And the map for this species is actually provided from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. They have the most updated information on where this species has been found. And as of um, October of 2022, the only county where um, hemlock woolly adelgid has not been found is Crawford County. So if anyone's searching for hemlock woolly adelgid in Crawford County and finds it, that will be news to the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. So keep your eyes peeled for that one in that location. Then we have beech leaf disease. This is kind of a newer species that I think is coming on the radar for more people. Um, I put in parentheses um, nematode because when you're reporting data for this species in IMAP, that is part of the species name, but the nematode is microscopic. So you're not actually going to see the nematode itself. You'll only see the signs and symptoms um, of what the nematode is doing to the beech tree. So again, more information about that is provided here for you. And a map of that species that is provided from Cleveland Metro Parks. And then finally, we have the mystery snail species, both Chinese and, and Japanese. So you can be looking for both or one or the other. Um, uh, whatever you choose. And I will mention um, the mystery snail species because that is an aquatic species, it's gonna be maybe a little bit more work um, to be searching for that species in um, the preferred habitats where it likes to reside. Um, so I will be sending out some additional information um, on how to go about to search for that species, but generally you can find it in um, the shallows of like a, a, a lake shore, for example. Um, it's not going to be found necessarily in like a deep section of a lake, so you don't need to be scuba diving or anything like that. Um, but you may need some, some waders or just be prepared to get a little wet in order to survey for this particular species. So again, um, I can send out some additional information about that. Um, or if folks have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, and that wraps up our presentation for today. Um, I do have my contact information listed here. Uh, the preferred way to get in touch with me, um, if you do have any questions or comments, uh, is through email. My email address is ajewitt at paconserve.org. Uh, I can also be reached um, by my office phone, which is 412-586-2305. Okay, so I see that as we've been going through our presentation today, we've had some questions come in. So I'm going to go through and uh, answer them in the order that they have come in. So first question from Lisa, will the checklist and information be printable? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, so this story map, um, is actually uh, printable and I can um, provide more information uh, in a follow-up email to everyone on how you can go about printing the story map. Um, so yes, that is printable. Uh, question from Juliana, will IMAP ever be updated to allow more than one photo? Sometimes I feel photos of multiple parts of a plant, for example, separate pictures of leaves and stems would be helpful. Great question. Yes. So Currently, the classic mobile app only allows you to submit one photo per record. We are hoping to have that updated soon, and it has been a request of many of our users to have that be updated. 
The Survey123 app does allow you to record more than one photo per observation. So if you're looking to use a mobile app, so recording data while you're out in the field, um, using that Survey123 app will allow you to record uh, more than one image at a time for um, a single observation record. Uh, also, the online database, if you're recording data there, that will also allow you to record, I believe, up to five images at a time uh, per record. So right now, it's just that classic mobile app that we are somewhat limited, but as I mentioned, we're hoping to get that updated soon. Um, so Rebecca says, I tried to find each of the mobile apps and all say that they are only available for older versions of Android phones. This includes Survey123 and IMAP Invasives. Any suggestions? Um, so I believe that there have been some um, bugs going on with the Androids, and I have an Android myself, um, and so it's been something that I've been dealing with as well. Um, Rebecca, I would say just reach out to me um, so we can follow up and make sure that we can get you set up there. If anyone else has any issues with getting access to the apps, depending on what device you are using, again, feel free to reach out to me um, and hopefully we can troubleshoot that and make sure to get you set up. Uh, Mike had a question. He's asking if one or more of the 10 targets have previously been reported for a site surveyed, is it okay to report it again with more current information and details? That's another good question. The answer to that is yes, please do. So um, part of what we do with IMAP invasives is to help to show how long some of these species have been present um, in particular areas. So maybe, for example, we have um, a report for purple loosestrife from 1975 in a particular area and it's still present today. So by recording another point for purple loosestrife in that area, we can kind of um, help to see that that population is still present. If you're recording a polygon, we can see you know, maybe how large that infestation is or how small it may have gotten over time. Um, so yes, please feel free to um, uh, report anything you're finding, even if we already have data for it, it might be data that is a little bit older. Okay, um, so Rose is saying, please talk about how to define a search area for a not detected species. Great question. So there's no right or wrong way necessarily for how to define the area that you're searching for a not detected species. Again, it's based on um, how you can record the data in IMAP. If you choose to just do a point um, or you know, like a larger polygon, um, or line area. But just in general, I would say, you know, kind of go to, um, you know, like a site if you're walking along a trail um, and just, you know, look for that species along that trail site. It doesn't have to be a large area necessarily. Um, you can make it as large or small um, as you choose to. So again, just keeping in mind, there's no right or wrong way to do this. I know we get that question a lot that people say, I don't want to mess up the data that's going into the database, but you can't really. Um, as long as you're, you know, searching for it in a particular area and you're reporting um, that data that you're saying, I searched here, um, you can always go into detail it, within the record. There's a comments area that you can say, you know, maybe how large of an area you, you surveyed um, or small, depending on how much effort or time you have. Um, so if there's any additional questions about that, if I'm not being as clear as I could be, uh, please again, just reach out to me. I'll try to help to clarify that. Okay, so there is a question that came through. I took part in the Take a Hike program throughout July. When we surveyed an area, we would take five photos for each finding. We would take a photo up close with a white plate in the back to show the plant's detail. We showed a height reference, leaf size reference, and a cluster photo from a distance. Is this how you would like when vetting the records. Um, so I would say, you know, yes, that's that's wonderful to, to take, um, uh, you know, obviously there's up close uh, images to have a white background to really help to show um, the plants. Um, that's that's really good. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not necessary every time. Again, just making sure that you are up close and are, are honing in on the, 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 the distinguishing characteristics of that species, that's really what's going to be the most important thing. It's kind of, you know, your judgment of how you feel 
a photo can be best taken. Um, and, and it can vary depending on what the species is. So I don't want to make people feel like they have to take a whole bunch of gear out with them when they're taking these images, um, but feel free to, to take some of those additional things with you and to try to you know show some of those different um, aspects of a plant or animal um, as you are capturing that in a photo. So again, I hope I'm being clear enough here, but if anyone has any questions about that, um, you know, again, feel free to, to reach out to me. But in general, just try to avoid some of the things that we talked about earlier. Don't stand from a distance and take an image. Uh, make sure that your image is clear and crisp and not fuzzy or blurry. Those are some of the general things to avoid doing. Um, and some of the things that I just mentioned here from the person that's making the comment are, are really great, wonderful things to aim for. So uh, that that's great. Um, so a uh, question from Amy. Um, I hope I didn't miss it, but an option to join a project isn't coming up in the menu on the app. Um, so uh, there, there is a way to be able to um, join the project for, for this particular event. Um, for example, in the classic mobile app, when you log into that, there is an app, or I'm sorry, there's a menu. Um, and in the menu, there's um, a section called preferences. In the preferences, section of that app is where you can actually choose to join the project. Those video tutorials will walk you through all that information. So if you haven't had a chance to watch those video tutorials yet, please make sure that you take the time to do that. And that will show you all the information that you need. If there's any questions afterwards or if something isn't clear, again, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, our, our training today, we were a little limited on time. So that's why I didn't do a live demonstration. Um, to show you how to do that. But again, any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, there's a question that came through. Will a presence observation be valid for the contest if it is incorrectly identified? Thank you for asking that question. Um, yes, it will still be valid because I don't expect everyone who's participating in this event to be a, a botanist, someone who's gone to school and is like super proficient in how to identify some of these plants or a zoologist and you study mystery snails and you know all about them. I know some people do, and but not all of us. Um, so as long as you're doing your homework, literally doing your homework here in this um, the story map and reading through, learning about these species and doing your best to identify them, um, it doesn't have to be correct, um, but it's your best guess to say, I think this might be purple leaf strife or I think this might be a mystery snail. Um, so that, again, that's why we have our experts go through, um, and look at this information afterwards. If something is incorrectly identified, um, we will, you know, not keep that in the database, but for purposes of this, you will still be given credit, um, if you are hoping to be a prize winner for the event. Uh, so we had another question. Can people search in teams? Is there a way? For multiple people to indicate that they are part of the same search team in IMAP Invasives. Um, so yes, if you'd like to search with other people as part of a team, that is fine. Um, I would recommend that all the data goes at least under one particular individual um, who is registered with IMAP Invasive. So if not everyone wants to have an account um, and just search as, as kind of a group effort, uh, that is fine to do so. And you can list that information in the comments section of the records that you are um, submitting, that you're, that you're surveying with um, a team and you can list those individuals if you'd like to. Um, another question came through, a friends group I belong to is in the process of removing European alders. Should this area be mapped? Good question. Um, so yes, I would say that you could record that European alder was present, I'm assuming, you know, earlier this year. Um, and, and you could maybe indicate that that area um, is currently being managed. Um, but if you're confident of the species identification, um, you know, we can talk about that again. We really do need to see the pictures of the plant in order to confirm that in IMAP. So uh, any questions about that, um, we can maybe talk a little bit further um, offline. Uh, a question from Trish, how is the Survey123 data uploaded when I go to the website? Is it automatic or a, an upload that I have to do? Uh, another good question. 
So both of the apps, the classic mobile app and Survey123, in that video tutorial for both of them, it will tell you how to do this, but there is a um, section where it will have you, um, you know, upload that information to IMAP. It's not necessarily automatic. Um, so you do want to just make sure you're referencing those tutorials and you know what to do in order to use them and then to go through and submit that data um, to the database. Uh, another question from Trish, I found a lot of the mystery snails on a shore of a local pond, but I'm not sure if it's a private property or not. How is this determined? I think there is a posted sign, but it's further in from the road. Um, so good question. It's going to depend. I, I'm not the best person to probably answer this, but I know in some places there's um, uh, information online that you can look up um, land parcels and, and try to figure out if it's publicly owned or privately owned. Um, so I would say err on the side of caution if you're not sure if it's um, public versus private and it ends up being private, you don't want to get in any kind of trouble there. Um, so you may talk with some of the other local folks in that area to determine if it's private property or not. Um, but if you're not sure, I would say don't survey there just to make sure that you're not surveying on someone's property and not talking to them first. Uh, another question from Diana. If I search a park um, one time, can I search another area in that park next time, or should I search another public area? Um, so I would say if you'd like to search um, uh, in a particular park, maybe at the beginning of August and search there again later, you know, in, in the month, that is fine. Um, I, you know, I think it's good to, if you can, search in multiple places. Um, it all depends on what, you know, kind of time and and effort you're able to put forth for the event. So it's really kind of up to you. Again, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Keeping in mind, the goal is to be searching for all of those species that are on the checklist. That's kind of the most important thing to keep in mind. Um, a question from Cindy, is it okay to record more than one population per species if found? Uh, yes, feel free to record multiple populations if you're finding mile a minute in this section of the park, mile a minute in another section of, of a park, um, that's totally fine to do. Um, so please feel free to do that. Uh, another question from Mike, is there any possibility that we can know who else in our particular area is involved in case we want to coordinate our survey work? Excellent question. Yes, if you go through um, and filter, use that filter records option in IMAP, um, and, and look through and see the data that's coming through in IMAP throughout the month of August, you should get a sense of who else is surveying in your area. Um, and if you'd like to have me help, you know, connect you guys, uh, if you'd like to coordinate with them, I'm happy to, to help make those connections if, if everyone is willing to be connected. Um, but yes, you can certainly use that filter records tool to um, look at the data that's coming in and see who else might be surveying in your area. A uh, question from Lisa. My community wants to identify invasives within its gates. Would IMAP invasives be helpful in this endeavor? Um, so you could use IMAP invasives to learn what species have already been found in perhaps the area that you're uh, referring to. Um, it's not necessarily a tool to learn to identify species per se. Um, there is a lot of amazing resources out there online that you can use to learn more about a species. Again, in the homework section of our presentation today, um, that's, you know, kind of drawing on some of those sources of information that are out there to learn to identify um, those species. But to actually learn of the distribution of it, that is something that IMAP invasives can certainly um, be used for. Okay, I'm going to try to speed up here because I see we only have um, a few minutes left in our presentation. Um, Mike asked if I uproot and remove a purple loosestrife plant when I record it, should that be identified as a control management activity? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Um, question from Amy, should I continue using the IMAP Invasives project through iNaturalist or just IMAP Invasives? Will it double post? Good question. So for this particular event, please make sure that you are reporting your data directly to IMAP Invasives. Um, you can also record data to iNaturalist. Um, that's not going to hurt anything, but please make sure that all of your data is getting reported directly to IMAP for the scavenger hunt event. 
A uh, question from Rebecca, the invasive species scavenger hunt 2023 released by the organization Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, does it matter that we are in North Central Pennsylvania? Uh, no, it does not matter where you are. Um, I work for the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, so I'm based in that region of the state. But this event is open to anyone, anywhere searching in Pennsylvania. So you can, does it matter that you're in North Central Pennsylvania? That is fine. Uh, another question from Rebecca. Um, I work for um, All and Waterways Conservancy, and if applicable for my region, would like to share with our membership and following. Yes, so please, again, Re Rebecca, please feel free to share with your folks. Um, North Central Pennsylvania is certainly um, uh, able to be part of this event. Um, and then one final question from Christine. How is the area defined? Um, basic question. Uh, so again, just kind of going back to there is no right or wrong way to define how large or small the area is that you are surveying. Um, again, as long as you are reporting that data in IMAP of, you know, just a point somewhere, or if you want to record a polygon to show the area that you searched in, um, you know, it's it, it's not going to matter either way as long as you are recording that data in IMAP. Um, but if there's any follow-up questions on that, again, please feel free to reach out to me. All right, lots of great questions and uh, obviously a lot of interest in this event, so I'm super excited. Um, and I just want to say thank you all for your attention today and your interest in participating. So I will get um, all the follow-up information that I talked about uh, to you all as soon as I can as well as a copy of today's uh, presentation so you can start taking a look at that homework section and anything else in the presentation that you'd like to uh, review. And again, please feel free to reach out to me if anyone has any questions. And I just wish everyone good luck with your surveys and I hope you have a great time. So thank you all and have a great time.